would like to start by asking you, um, what is your earliest memory? Your earliest childhood memory, and how old were you? Oh, the first, um, the first uh, uh, art memory I had was that I was drawing a um, Ludwig von Drake from the comic books. And I did it, and I brought it to my father, and he said, oh, that's a good tracing job. And I said, no, I didn't trace it, you know. And I think I was like about four, five. I was really mad at him. Was your father involved in any area of art? Oh, no, not at all. He was an attorney. He was a mortarman in the war. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be a, um, a mortarman, and I wanted to be in the Army, just like my dad. And they got really nervous about that. At what that. age did you imagine yourself? <sighs> Um, I, it was young. It was young. And so they took me to, um, uh, you know, this is the time when uh, they were concerned about their firstborn being, you know, trying to, you know, meet, match up with his, the father. So they took me to a uh, psychologist and he said, oh, no, he's just an artist. Just, you know, get him to be creative. And what age was that? I think I, st I, I had this... I, I don't think I was in school yet. I think it was, must have been five you or... You were pronounced an artist by... I was pronounced creative and that I should be, you know, encouraged that because I wasn't going to be able to do anything else. <laughs> so. <laughs> so they, they, they Which was a trauma. Yeah, pretty much so. Well, because it didn't have any pictures in it. I don't think I read my first real book until I was uh, in sixth grade. And I even know the, the book. It was Shag, Last of the Great Plains Buffalo. And it was a great book, and my kids found it and, and bought it for me. And it's just so beautiful because, you know, Shag, his parents get killed, and he's the last of the male buffaloes on the, you know, on the, on the prairies. Great book. Read that at sixth grade. My kids, of course, read it when they were, you know, kindergarten, first grade. But. Did you have any <laughs> sense that either of your parents was disappointed? No, my grandfather was, my grandfather. In fact, uh, my grandfather um, constantly wrote me that, you know, he, he felt that I could do my work on Sundays, but that I had it in me to be a manager of some store one day. So, you know, when I became the director of the museum school, he would have been proud because I was managing something. But uh, no, he, 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 was, he offered me full, full ride to any school I wanted to if I'd just get off the art stuff. And... Um, there wasn't any you any question. No, 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 no. Um, I was curious. How often do you dream? How often do I dream? It depends. If I if I drink coffee at around eight o'clock, I'll have caffeine dreams, and those are always fun. Um, but for the most part, now because I'm taking um, uh, Requip for restless legs, oh. knocks me out in like an hour. So um, you know, I haven't really had much dreams what lately. Um, well, you know, um, they're kind of a cross between, um, um, what's the guy, Hunter Thompson, <laughs> and, uh, and um, I don't know, like a Keaton movie. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just kind of wacky, Dying weird stuff. Buster? Buster. Uh -huh. Only Buster. The imagery that um, <laughs> appears in your artwork, uh -huh. so much of that seems rather dreamlike. To mm. me, did mm -hmm. that ever come from things you saw in the oh, night? Oh, yeah. I mean, occasionally. The the but the best stuff comes um, by just working the materials, um, like um, the uh, the sundial piece that I did, where the it's my brother is looking down and it's a tree, and then this the sun has sort of created this pattern with the um, the the tree, and the guy is following it, and it, you find out that he's just been walking around in a circle, and that just sort of occurred because of the relationship of the tree and this guy looking down. And like, wait a minute, you know, it, it's sort of like a sundial, and he'll do this sort of. Um, Pooh and Piglet had a. Um, you can tell I have five girls, and so there's a scene in Pooh and Piglet where um, they're hunting for um, heffalumps, I think, and they're they're watching the, these steps in the snow, and they of course come upon their own, you know, uh, uh, footsteps, but they think that they're now two hepalumps instead of just one when Pooh started. And I was thinking about that when I was doing my work. So, you know, a lot of things kind of come in, you know, from the um, absurd stuff to the absolutely uh, 
ridiculous, you know. I mean, they just sort of come in and they work out. Like this one I just thought was funny that his, he's concerned about something, somebody coming in to the door but his briefcase is on fire. And, uh, and the, the space itself is uh, so murky because I re re redid the drawing so many times there wasn't much more surface to go on. So it kind of lost all of the major tonality in it just because I reworked it so much. And a lot of times then. What the objective in reworking it? What didn't you like? To find the image. I mean, I liked, um, I liked what was happening. I liked the relationship of the fellow uh, crouching behind, uh, you know, this table, but I didn't know how to place him in there. A lot of times I view my work very similar to the way I dealt with my theater, which is I have a space, now I've got to occupy it, and uh, how best to... Um, to activate it, you know, what is it this, that this person would do within that space? And then, of course, being me, there's a slight touch of paranoia because the Cossacks are going to come at any moment. I mean, that's why I use charcoal instead of oil paint, sort of that feeling, well, you know, if they come, I can just pack up all my materials and go and still do my work with a piece of uh, twig that's burned up and uh, I, can, I can find some parchment somewhere. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's always that sense of the pathos, but there's always that, and then there's always that sense of just, you know, kind of laughable, you know, curiosity. I mean, the, the you know, the fact that his briefcase is, is, is on fire, you know, and, um, or that uh, in one of the pieces, the, uh, the fellow's watering his belongings, it's called belongings, a whole bunch of boxes out on the, on the plains, and he's watering them as if he's going to, you know, make his, his belongings kind of come to life and, you know, keep them nourished. Um, you know, strange things that, that, that combine a real solidity, like, oh, that, that's a real person, those are real boxes, but the combination makes it very strange. So, um, you know, dreamlike, yeah, I guess they are in a way. Tell us about the whittling man. <laughs> well, my, my daughters who are in physics um, uh, are really mad at that one because it, physics on it is all wrong. But I had this idea that this guy's just whittling and he whittles so much that his chair, you know, starts being picked up by the whittling. And, um, you know, it's not as if he's making anything. It's just this notion about, you know, doing what you do and it just sort of piles up and he's up on there. Um, so that's sort of where that came from. In fact, um, I was talking with uh, Ray McKinnon who who is the who's an actor and and a writer, and he was saying something about how he has this image of himself uh, looking out over this landscape from a something like a lighthouse or a, a fire, you know, station. And I like the idea of the height. And um, the show that I've been working on is for South Dakota, so I've been looking at old travel photographs of South Dakota and trying to integrate some of those images. And um, I found this one of this um, old uh, fire station on the top of the hill. And I thought, well, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to combine the two, but let's, let's give the guy a little bit more to do. So originally, the, the guy was um, creating this little um, paper card house and sort of viewing it in the, you know, on the landscape. And then I just sort of decided, wait a minute, you know, whittling is sort of more what they do, you know. <laughs> I'll put him up there. And then, of course, after I put him up there, um, I decided that rather than compete with the, you know, the um, fire station, I'd make the fire station the actual, you know, whittling. So I took out the fire station and then started building up the, the whittling. Because originally I was going to have both piles kind of going like as if he was building up another one on, on another side. So it's just, you know, that's sort of what happens. And then because I'm working with latex uh, as my ground, as you draw into it, it just wipes the surface more slick and slicker. And um, it produces some nice tonal changes as I erase or move out of it. But it also creates a kind of slickness that makes it almost impossible for the, uh, the charcoal to, to stay on. In hearing you talk about your work, it um, points out maybe a, a contrast that, that I'm kind of surprised to hear. I, I see in your work so many metaphors, mm -hmm. but it almost sounds as if the metaphor is not the beginning of place, but the place at which the work arrives. Right. You don't. You don't ever start from the metaphor to uh, to um, arrive at a uh, at a visual image. The visual image has to resonate and suggest that metaphor. So, um, a, a, a lot of the times, um, 
I suppress what I think. If I, if I were to be an abstract expressionist, um, I think the, the energy level would be sort of off the wall. And um, I'd always feel like I was totally out of control. So what I do is very similar, I think, to, well, you know, if I'm going to compare. Like Cezanne's early work is this whole melodrama and, you know, wild sexuality and bizarre stuff. And his later work is all that sort of suppressed, kind of thing, a rationalism, but that in his individual strokes you get the feeling that there's just this energy just writhing right under the surface. So for me, it's, it's you know, I, I want to create images that are so far away from me that I can look at them and play with them, but that still have that kind of resonance underneath them. The, the, the you know, um, you know, very similar to say uh, surrealism in which it's not the objects themselves that are important, it's their conjunction, their uh, combination. And so for me, the, there's an energy with com combining certain types of, you know, mundane images to other certain mundane images. Um, so I always start off with the physical and then, you know, um, the only way these things are going to work is if they start resonating, creating a kind of magnetism with each other. Um, but I, I always tell students and, and um, other people that, that to start off with a metaphor like, you know, hatred or, you know, peace in our day, you know, it just never goes anywhere. You've, you've got to set it out concretely. And if anything, um, being, you know, having done plays in New York City really helped that out because you're, you're dealing with physicality there.